There's a word for autism in the Maori language, takiwaitanga. It means in one's own time and space. And that's a particularly fitting description for the artist Susan Takaharangi King. Susan is a 71-year-old, non-speaking, autistic woman. Her middle name means precious one in Te Rau Māori, the language of the indigenous people of Aotearoa, New Zealand. That her parents gave her that name more than seven decades ago is prescient. They must have known Susan was one of a kind. Susan is an artist in every sense of the word. She can draw exact copies of old-time cartoon characters from memory. She can create perfect sweeping arcs without the help of a protractor. And she can and has gone through fallow periods where she makes no work at all. More recently, though, Susan's work has come into its own and is now being exhibited and collected all over the world after decades of obscurity. Because Susan doesn't speak or use any adaptive communication technology, we weren't able to interview her. But she did listen to a couple of episodes of The Loudest Girl in the World and was also lulled to sleep by the show. Amazingly, she made a piece of art inspired by what she heard. Truly, it was an honor to see my story interpreted visually by such a talented artist. And for a limited time, we're giving away prints of Susan's Loudest Girl-inspired art. Go to our website, pushkin.fm slash loudestgirl, to enter our giveaway. Now, I don't know if Susan liked our show, but her sister, Petita Cole, who serves as her manager, told me that Susan was engaged and inspired at least before the show made her sleepy. In this very special bonus episode of The Loudest Girl in the World, we talked to Petita about how Susan blossomed as an artist and found her creative voice. It's the story of a disabled artist's genius flourishing late in life, but it is also the story of a sisterly bond for the ages. My name is Petita Cole and I'm Susan's sister. I'm uh, nine years younger than her. Um, So Susan Te Kahurangi King is my sister. Um, She was born in 1951 in Te Aroha, New Zealand. And Susan uh, is mostly known for her amazing artwork. As a young kid from around about the age three, she began to lose her speech which was almost non-existent at the age of five and pretty near gone by the age of seven. And it appears that as her as her speech was going, her her drawing came up. <laughs> One thing loses and the other gains. I guess it's uh, compensation, I don't know. Um, but obviously there's a real skill and passion there that has driven that that output. And so what were your parents, what did they do? Were they, were they born in New Zealand? Um, did they, how did they end up there? Like, I'm just trying to get a sense of your, all, your, your geography, your family geography. Right, yeah. Um, Mum and Dad met in Te Aroha in a small town in New Zealand and uh, married and actually lived in an old tent out the back of the family home, <laughs> a little old army tent, Um for about a year or less than a year, something like that, and lived in Te Aroha until 1960 mm-hmm. when they mm-hmm. shifted to Auckland, the city. Basically, when we shifted from Te Aroha to uh, Auckland, that was basically because there was no place for Susan in the small town of Te Aroha as far as uh, schools were concerned. She did go to a school when she was five (laughs) um, and she was there for a couple of months and and then the teacher said, look, you need to get her hearing test, you need to get, you know, you need to get her sorted basically, go do some tests and things. So she needed to go to Auckland for that. There was a school for people with disabilities starting up in Auckland and so the family shifted so mm-hmm. that she could attend that school. They called it an intellectually handicapped school. It was called IHC. I mean, what did 
specialists, doctors say about Susan at the time? How did they diagnose her? How did they determine she should go to a different school, a special school? Like what, what were they saying about her at the time? When she went and had the tests, basically the top child psychologist in New Zealand at that time had his reporting, uh, and I can't remember it exactly, so I can't quote, but basically his summary was, it's probably a virus. She might be better uh, if she isn't. Don't worry, there are institutions for people like this. There are hundreds of them. So it was basically the recommendation was, um, if it doesn't work, you can just put her in one of those places. Oh. Which, of course, was unthinkable for, for our parents because, um, you know, Susan's their, you know, loved daughter, and they will embrace her and support her in the journey, but not sending her off to some unknown thing for that. So basically, the, the normal mainstream professionals had nothing to offer. They basically said, come back in a couple of years' time. But there was no supports or no sort of recommendations, really. So then our parents were kind of like, well, maybe alternative practitioners, you know, so go to a, a, a um, what do you call it? Um, like a naturopathic doctor or? A... Yeah, yeah, and also the where you get um, massage, that sort of thing. Oh, sort of like an acupuncture, acupressure, or sometimes Chinese medicine or Eastern medicine yeah, or something. Yeah, just yeah. alternative um, forms, yeah. That, that's right, so to relax her back, just to, a relaxation thing like that. And then there was also color therapy. They tried at some stage, uh, an iridologist. There was a palm reader. There was somebody who... <laughs> I think they called it a radiothesist. It's like radioactive waves. And he had, um, he said, it's the cosmic circle. <laughs> it's the, the water stream that is near your home. You need to shift her position of her bed in the room and put the pillow at the other end. And then surely everything will be right after that. It's the cosmic circle. <laughs> And then there was another one who said, with regard to Susan losing her speech, and they said to mum, well, have you ever said shut up? And it's like, well, maybe. <laughs> and they said, well, even when she's in the womb, did you ever say shut up? Or, well, I could have, you know. Well, then that's it. It's your fault. <laughs> You've basically put a curse. <laughs> so, um, you know, one thing to another, basically, there were no answers. There were no supports. I mean, even the church, the Sunday school that they went to, they told her not to come anymore because she had stopped talking, but she did actually sing. I have heard of that with other people with autism as well, that there's something where, although you don't speak, you might sing. And I don't ever remember Susan singing with words, but I do remember her humming. So. But of course, you know, she'd go to Sunday school and she would sing like everyone else. But then when they stopped, she carried on. So like, you can imagine that would be a bit annoying <laughs> if you're trying to like, oh, you know. So basically they said she couldn't, she couldn't come anymore, you know, which upset her greatly. So she couldn't go to Sunday school. She couldn't go to school. Uh, and then she was at home and she would... She had a large tricycle, actually, a three-wheeler, and it was quite cold. It was quite big, and she would just go off for miles. <laughs> um, and this little kid uh, passed all the streets, you know, she, and she did run away from home a few times as a kid, went up, the, went up the mountain, and apparently she did get on a bus and went all the way to Hamilton from Te Aroha as well. She, she did run away. Um, she was a wanderer. Yeah, she was a bit of a wanderer, but I guess if you have limitations and you've got uh, a strong a strong will, and it's like, well, I'll I'll I'll, I'll sort myself out. <laughs> right, right. Do, do you have a sense of how Susan got exposed to to making art? You know, I mean, obviously, all kids or most kids have access to pens and paper and just naturally doodle and express themselves visually. But do you have a sense of how that happened for Susan and how that became an outlet? Um, I think that it's within her anyway. 
and then that was nurtured. So, um, you know, when I look at her drawings from when she's a five-year-old and she's really exploring shapes and ideas and, you know, it's not just the odd picture here or there. She's really exploring them, exploring what she's thinking. For example, characters like, Donald Duck and um, just really exploring the furrowed brow and the bow tie and the beak, just details, just and playing around with it, even at a very young age, almost as if you're a uni student doing, <laughs> you know, you're right. a student at uni doing a thesis on whatever and you have a plan to do such and such and you do it. But this it's like that sense of, I don't know if it's a compulsion or a, uh, it's more than a compulsion, it's a just a real sensitivity to it and a talent. But I, I think too that possibly the encouragement also goes a long way. You know, when she was staying at my grandmother's place, incredible really, the details that grandma has noted. For example, look, I, I, I spilled a bottle of cream today and now she's drawn this and it had a picture of all these buckets of paint all spilled over with all the colours going around. So it's like a fantastical version of what grandma did and, and um, you know, grandma's experience of dropping the cream. But for her to make that connection and then to document it um, at, at a young age when Susan was just five or six and then grandma's written in her notes, you know, you know, I'm keeping all her drawings and putting dates on them because she'll become famous one day or, you know, like that, that really that she had. Yes, yes. She says, I'd like to show them to a person in the arts, you know, who can recognize this talent. And so she had this understanding or um, appreciation of Susan's works, even at a very young age. Yeah. Uh, Grandma also had a, uh, a lot of interests and she would look and think closely you know at a lot of things like she also had um a real interest in the development of the motorways back then and buildings and so <laughs> she's got all these photos slides upon slides that she's actually gone out deliberately to take a record, photographic record of the development of the motorways and oh the and God. the roads, um, and then she would even go back to get it. I've got the uh, I've got it from this angle. I need to go somewhere else and get it from that angle, or get it in the morning or the end <laughs> of the day light. You know, so there's this fixation on detail and architecture and construction, and in very very often Susan would come with her on those trips. So it's kind of like grandma's almost encyclopedic interest in so many different aspects going on in I'm, the world. I mean, grandma sounds a little autistic, you know? Uh, I, yeah, probably. Like, you know, uh, it's kind of like, um, yeah, yeah, probably. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, those are very particular interests and the sort of recording of all of those. But I think that it's so interesting because it sounds like, you know, with a with a granny like that, she was very open to whatever Susan needed or whatever her abilities, like she wasn't put off by the fact that Susan didn't speak. She was interested in her art. She was interested in bringing her around to the things that she was doing. Like she was encouraging, it seems like, or and supportive. Yeah, very much so. And very aware uh, and accommodating of Susan's anxieties, particularly as a young child. Um, yeah, anxieties with all kinds of things, sounds and um, and just Susan kind of at a young age going quite wild, like shaking her head, rubbing the her food all over her face and on the floor and, you know, just being like hyperactive and um shouting or uh, just not settling at night, still being up at till midnight sort of thing, just can't settle her. Um, so there was quite a bit of stuff going on as a young child for Susan, um, anxieties. And um, so it was really nice for her to have this time out and to be herself. When do you figure people started to realize, oh, this person has a lot of talent and like when when was Susan's work 
you know, when did it begin to have public exposure? At some point, it flipped over where people actually, you know, took notice. Back in 1970 would have been Susan's first splash in the news. So what happened with the Intellectually Handicapped School, they have a, a door-to-door collection, you know, every every year. And so they would basically profile one of the attendees each year to profile the IHC, um, who they are and what they do. And this, here's a collect opportunity for you to donate to them. And so in 1970s, Susan was profiled. And so one or two of her drawings uh, featured on a full page ad in the big, you know, uh, New Zealand Herald or Auckland Star, whatever it was back then. And also at that time, uh, some of Susan's drawings were sent by the Intellectually Handicapped School uh, to London for an auction there, an exhibition and an auction. Um, interestingly enough, we didn't know prior to that, there was no request or, uh, you know, it, they, they just went. And then several months later or whatever, our parents received a letter from the school to say, hey, we sent some of, you know, Susan's works and some were sold. So here's five pounds. Um, <laughs> five pounds. <laughs> so here's five pounds. And they were sold to a member of the public. I mean, that's amazing because you know, they weren't thinking of this as professional art. I mean, you've seen this a million times, right? This this happens a lot um, is like autism art programs and it's put on by parents and it's like, like, look what the kids can do. And then people buy them to be nice and to raise money. And it's, you know, it's like a little art show, but like here you have a world-class talent and it's so, but they, they probably didn't know that. I mean, it's weird to think like, Or it must be frustrating to think, like, if there was a way for her talent to be recognized earlier in a wider world, would things have been different for her or how would her life be different? Um, Yeah, exactly. The word autism never came on the radar the whole several decades that she was at the IHC school for that entire time. It's only in recent years that 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 came to the family's awareness. I mean, my first teaching job in 2002 was at a disability school, and it was only when I was um, interacting and working with people with autism that I kind of thought, whoa, (laughs) Um, I get it. Susan must be autistic. And it's like, and then I went and said to mum, mum, I'm sure Susan must be autistic. And mum mum goes, what's that? (laughs) Um, And it it had never been on the radar. It's like, what's this? And of course, as soon as you realise that, then it's like, oh, okay. So you can start sort of joining the dots and thinking, okay, so um, this strategy might help or now I better understand that because that's you know the the, the, there's just understanding and and support comes with with autism I think right well it's two you you have two kind of uh dueling issues here one which is just general understanding and support of autistic people getting an appropriate diagnosis getting appropriate interventions And then the sort of art piece of it, which is not necessarily knowing what to do with that, not like having a lot of resources in in that way. And so, I mean, obviously, it seems like, though we do not know, uh, it has worked out okay for Susan. She is in a very supportive family, it seems, and has been able to flourish and make the art that she wants and have seemingly a lot of sort of latitude and flexibility but there must be a sort of for you at least like who knows what could have happened like if if the services were better if the understanding was better if the language around uh disability was better uh all of that yeah and I think you know I mean I look back and I think well I think the saddest is is that period where she had stopped drawing and that was from the early 1990s 
uh, for a long time, you would go back home and mum's busy doing something, whatever, and Susan's just sitting there, just in the doldrums, just, you know, long face or whatever. And you say, hi, Susan, and there's no response. No, it just, I don't know. So I don't know what was going on in her mind or, you know, and I mean, mum and dad are great, you know, and they would be uh, their home and they would do what they can to encourage her. But it's like just not going there. It's like she was locked. I don't know whether she locked herself in that way or just it was locked. But I think there was a sadness there too. And I don't know. I just don't know. I'll never know. Uh, in around about 2005, that's when I decided Susan's Susan's not in a happy place. She's um, despondent. She's not engaged, you know, and, and the contrast there also just knowing like there's poor Susan and look at her amazing works. I, I have never been in a position where I've actually gone to find out what actually are all these drawings. I knew that there were stacks and stacks of them stored away at our parents' place, you know, in boxes and cases and rolled up in the rafters and all sorts. So that's when I started what I call the archival project, um, basically just unearthing box after box and processing them, basically just beginning to catalogue them. And I was involving Susan in that too. So I would go and get them and then Susan can come home with me and she can help, you know, put them into the pages and um, looking through them. So I think that she did seem to enjoy that and it was nice for her to be in involved in the process and to see these drawings that she hadn't seen for decades and decades. Right. So instead of providing her with materials, which you had all done and it and it wasn't spurring any engagement with her, you said, hey, why don't you participate in this project where we save all of your previous work? And so it's a different kind of orientation for her where she doesn't have to produce anything, but she is engaging with what she has done previously. And so I'm guessing that that kind of slowly brought something back to life for her? Yeah, yeah. Well, I think her, her engaging in that and her seeing her works and her seeing that her works are being appreciated as well and just enjoying them, really. And then um, by 2008 is when Dan Salmon uh, found out about Susan's artwork. That's the documentarian. Yeah, so he made the documentary. So basically he approached me and said, hey, um, I'd love to do a documentary about Susan's life and her works. But he he asked that really important question, which was, I think, is, was pivotal in this whole, with Susan starting to draw again. He basically said, um, do you think that Susan would or could ever draw again? I think that there is something about when somebody outside the family asks, especially if he's going to do a film and he's just asking this question, I, I'm not going to give a, an answer to that without actually really looking into the possibilities. And, and I think too that what, what actually helped through teaching at the disability school, typically what we would do is work with the students and the parents and their supporters to identify what are their, what do they have and, and, you know, what are their skills and where are we going? What are the goals? And with your goals, what are the strategies you're going to have in place to reach that goal? So basically, I think that I, I subconsciously as applying that to Susan. It's like, OK, so if this is a goal as to can she or would she draw again, what are the strategies or approaches to put in place to possibly bring that about? And so it's not just like, oh, do you want some pencils? It's like, hey, I've got to think outside the square here. Um, who's going to be involved and what are the different approaches that we could we could um, have? So um, I spoke with mum and, and my brother Bernard, who's living with mum at the time, and within a couple of weeks she was drawing. <laughs> now, now, wait, I, I want to back up and say, like, your interest in helping Susan re-engage with her art was that you saw that making art gave her a sense of joy and fulfillment and purpose in her days um, or that she enjoyed it and you wanted to help 
sort of provide an on-ramp for her to sort of get that joy back. Absolutely. So that was the rush. That was the urgency and that was the real crunch of it. But also knowing that these drawings are just absolutely fantastic. And then you feel this weight or this kind of burden that it's like, these are too good to be just here. They need to be out there. We need to hear other people and she needs to hear other people say, these are amazing. Not in a patronizing way of that's nice, Susan. <laughs> right, right. Not a pat on the head, like good, good. Like actually this is this is world-class art. Yes, yes, th- that's right. D- now, um, I want to talk about, obviously Susan's had a lot of styles over the years, but if you were to sort of sum up her artistic sensibility, her artistic style, how would you do that? Um, Her content is encyclopedic. She covers from creatures to architecture to cartoon characters to text, even though she cannot read or write, to abstract concepts like pulling, pushing, tension, pouring, so she'll have a jug pouring, spoons pouring, things pouring, what's this pouring business? <laughs> or, or, or uh, you know, one of the intrigues I've been uh, looking through recently is what I call Susan's bird people. <laughs> <laughs> she's got people in her drawings, but then, and she's also got a lot of birds, but she's got these amazing, so many different varieties of, is that more a bird or a person, you know, personified birds or birdified people and just like, <laughs> whoa, how did you do that? It's like, like a bird, a bird flying up off the page. It looks like a beautiful bird, like a real bird, not a cartoon bird, but it's wearing Donald Duck's jacket. <laughs> um, uh, and then she's got another one where she's got a cow and the cow has got Donald Duck's jacket on. And then some of the other ones where jo- Donald Duck has taken his jacket off. So now he's in the nude. And then you're reminded that actually the whole time Donald wears his jacket, he's never worn any pants. <laughs> Although he has his gloves on, he's, lo- he's lost his pants. And somehow he seems fully dressed without pants. Um, so these kind of things come to you. Um, but uh, yeah, it's kind of... Um, her drawings, I, I think that they're an expression of what she's going through. Like sometimes there's pure joy. And, and I do remember her years ago, like she'd be laughing when she's drawing. <laughs> um, and it's like, what are you thinking? What do you know while she's drawing? Then other ones are, are, are quite quite dark and quite sort of like, wow, what is what is this? And I mean, if we have things that we're a bit upset about or a bit confused about, things that we want to clarify our understandings or discuss something, we can do that with each other. But how does Susan process a misunderstanding or a fear or a, an anxiety about something? And she can't converse with somebody about it. So some of her, her drawings, that they're the conversations that she never had. Right. And when you think about all the conversations you have, well, depends on who they're with and what they're about and when. So, uh, you know, but they're more than all the conversations she never had because they're just done so brilliantly. You know, Mm -hmm. they're not just they're not just some ideas and we happen to have them all. It's like, man, how, how do you compose such a thing? How do you like some of the drawings are a real tangle, a depth of. Uh, characters like in action doing all this stuff but there's this one entwined with that one and this one's in front of that one that's behind that it's got this all these things going on but there's no sketchy lines no rubbers and no rubbers news no erasers how do you do that so I think it's and I'm not just saying this because you know if you you know how mothers think that their their kid is the most beautiful and clever kid in the world, and they and they and they can't see past that because it's their own kid. But so I'm, it's not just because she's my sister. It's like I look at that and I go, "This is this is just this is brilliant." Yeah, I'm curious when when did she first sell? When did you first? When did somebody first acquire one of her her works? Her first exhibition was in Sydney at Callan Park and yeah the works were not for sale so none none sold there 
And that's because explicitly we just said, well, you know, the works are not for sale. Because basically we've only just unearthed all these works that we haven't seen for ever. And we don't know this world. We, did, we didn't know the art world. And so we don't want to run the risk of making a mistake. So, you know, so just to be safer, it's like they're not for sale. But, you know, and, and then uh, Susan's um, first uh, show in the States was in 2014. Where, where was that? That was in New York at the Outsider Art Fair and then followed shortly after at the Andrew Edlin Gallery. And initially, when we were approached for these uh, exhibitions over there, we said, yeah, sure, but they're not for sale. And they said, that's okay. They're too good not to be shown. Let us uh, show these. But then, you know, like we sort of decided, you know, looking closely at it and, and realizing, man, you know, this doesn't happen without passion, without dedication, without expense. And in fairness, it's like, uh, it's not until you step into that world and be begin to become familiar with it and develop a bit of trust that then you realize, well, hang on a minute, this may be a good for Susan for, for some works to be made available for sale because, you know, these can be put into collection and, and, and then the collectors get in behind and they can help to, you know, whatever. So, so yeah, that was 2014 uh, was, was when her works were um, first sold other than the one in 1970 that was sold for five pounds and we don't well. know who and we don't know what it was <laughs> <laughs> so so really I mean she had been making art for gosh since the mid 50s until really the 2010s before people in the international scene recognized her talent yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. It's a long time, isn't it? <laughs> it is. It is a long time. Did you observe when Susan's work started getting attention? Did you observe in her any kind of shift or recognition that other people thought her work was really special? With Susan, definitely. It, it was, it was, uh, the transformation was phenomenal. It was absolutely amazing. Uh, her whole demeanor, her whole facial, like there's a lift, her eyes would spark, she'd lift her head, even stand up straight because she's got a bit of an old stoop going on there. Um, I can remember also when the documentary was being shot, which involved, you know, like Susan being there with important people coming for interviews and that sort of thing and the lights and the cameras and you know so Susan was beginning to feel quite special you know with the filming of the of the show and and um at around that time one of the jobs that Susan would do at home <laughs> was to empty the billy and that's just a scrap bucket at the end of the kitchen bench good exercise got to walk all the way down the back of the section down by the bush and empty it and bring it back up again it's a good, <laughs> good walk get your nose in the fresh air but but when she was starting to get famous and everything and people you know all this attention and everything and and mum noticed oh Billy's not getting emptied you know and then mum would sort of say to Susan oh Susan go empty the billy and she'd just look at it and then <laughs> she's like I'm not emptying the billy anymore <laughs> <laughs> oh, I just thought that she's was too so good for that. She's too yeah, good for that. I just thought, whoa, that's just so good. What attitude. It's like um <laughs> not wow. even doing it anymore because I'm a recognized artist. Oh my god, that is hilarious. Um, why do you think that her work has resonated with so many people? You know, what is it about it that speaks to folks? Yeah, um, it's hard to uh, summarize that, um, but I think that maybe it's the self-taught approach where it's just so it's quite it's very unique. It's kind of earthy, you know, in the sense that it's not superficial, it's not fancy prissy or anything. It's just like it's like whoa. It's like um, I think whether you're old or young or whether you're educated or not educated in arts is something that like arrests your attention and grabs you, pulls you in. And, and um, 
I mean, even, even you know, her works that are quite abstract and there's no not a lot of figurative, recognisable sort of objects in there. When you look at it and you think, well, man, what is going on here? You know, like it might be just like projections of lines and the way she's composed that. And, and it's like, I don't know, there's something, there's something quite captivating about it that that draws you in I think sometimes too that it's not in your face that what you see is what there is at first glance so it's not like just a big square with a big flower in the middle it's like you look and then you look again and then you look again it's like my gosh there's more and more and I think that's that everyone wants an adventure <laughs> or to find yeah, treasure. Totally. For for people who are not familiar with Susan or her work or her story, what do you think it's important for people to take away and to understand about her? Hmm. Well, <laughs> um obviously she's an amazing artist and that Susan's got this treasure that could possibly have gone unknown. And Susan, having been discovered as an artist, and Susan going back to her drawing has basically saved her life. I mean, I can't begin to imagine if she had done another decade of not drawing and not being recognised. It's like, I just can't even, it's unthinkable. But when I think about it, well, she actually did it for 15 years. How did that happen? And Oh my gosh, you know, so I think that's an, an, an encouragement that to encourage us to look about us, look within us, you know, uh, are there other people, you know, that we can help or that can be helped? <laughs> but, but it doesn't happen without dedication, you know, like Susan's lucky there have been so many people with passion, belief, dedication to actually, it's, it's almost like the stars got to be aligned, you know, it, 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 that one thing happens and then that's dependent on another happening. So it's not going to happen without commitment and passion mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and, and dedication. But um, I, I would like to think that other people can be discovered and their treasures appreciated. Yeah. Petita Cole is the younger sister and manager of the artist Susan Takaharangi King. You can check out Susan's work on Instagram at Susan Takaharangi King. That's Susan, T-E-K-A-H-U-R-A-N-G-I King. This episode was produced by David Ja and edited by Sophie Crane. Mix engineering by Jake Gorski. Thanks to you, friend, for listening.